Hello, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, so we'll start. My name is Slavek Solecki of Cornell University. I'm a, a more the moderator for the for the, the talk that's uh, at 7:15. So it is my uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jan Hesthaven of EPFL, and he will talk on structure preserving model order reduction of Hamiltonian system. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the, to the scientific committee for the ICM of, of giving me the opportunity. And, and certainly also thank you to, to Shumaya, to, to Martin Haya for, for arranging this on short notice, uh, given the, the circumstances. So um, I will talk about, as I said, structural preserving model order reduction of Hamiltonian systems. Uh, I'll try to explain what this means, assuming that uh, some of you, many of you perhaps um, are not fully aware of, of uh, the kind of work. Uh, I should also say that the work is, is the result of, of, uh, of an effort over at least five years with uh, two, two former students, uh, Babak Mubadi and uh, Nicola Ripamonti, and the former postdoc, uh, Cecilia Pacchettini. So, um, so, okay. Okay, so, so what's the setting? So the setting is we're interested in solving PDEs that are parameterized where uh, mu is a parameter uh, or a set of parameters. And we would like to be able to solve this PD uh, while varying the parameter and, and perhaps sampling the solution of the PD uh, a very high number of times. Uh, so uh, where can we work and have interest in problems like this? Well, this can be an optimization, inversion, uh, control problems where the parameter is part of the problem and you need to try and vary that. Uh, uncertainty quantification is an area trying to understand what is the impact of the solution of varying uh, material coefficients, boundary conditions, things that you may not be fully aware of. Subscale models where you want to sample variations uh, and feed that into a, a multi scale modeling. Uh, but it can also be a situation where you want to have a model which is somehow faster uh, because you want to use it in a deployed fashion in near real time situation or uh, on a cell phone. Um, and very often, of course, you're not interested in the full solution, you're interested in, in some function of interest uh, that, that uh, you're looking for. So, so, so the idea of a roof or a model in some sense is a simple one. You, you have a PDE that connects the parameters to the object of interest. And you would like to figure out what that map is. Now you have the PDE and you can solve this problem. But of course, if the PDE is a complicated PDE, then whenever you change the parameter, you have to solve the PDE again and the cost is high. So the simple way of looking at it is, can I take what is met on this figure and exchange this for something else that allows us to achieve this without uh, simplifying the solution? Okay, so this is the idea of a crystal model. And basically you will see what you do is you give up generality, focusing on a particular type of problems that you then can accelerate. So the idea of, of acceleration, in, in, at least in the way that, that I will discuss it here, it's relatively simple. Let's say you have an ODE or it can be a semi-discrete PDE. Uh, where set is the number of, of uh, uh, variables. And now, of course, if this is a semi-discrete PD, then set uh, dimension can be extremely high, the number of degrees of freedom. Um, and now, let's conjecture that there is another basis than the one you're using, time element, whatever, but you're looking for another basis, which is, which is uh, expressed in the matrix A. So you should think of A as a, small, as a tall and skinny matrix with a small number of columns uh, that you're, you're basically assuming that I can express what I see in set 
by a different uh, linear space. Now, of course, this linear space would be problem dependent, so we would have to learn it. But nevertheless, that's the simple idea. Let's imagine that this is the case. Well, if this is the case, you plot your assumption into the PDE or ODE at this point in time, and you do a Galoikian projection, basically requiring that the, the uh, residual is orthogonal to the space that you have just defined in the matrix A. And we now get a system of equations with this new variable Y. Now the new variable Y, if indeed the matrix is tall and skinny, will be of a much lower dimension. And therefore, whenever you solve the problem, you simply solve a much smaller problem. And, uh, and when you need the solution back, you multiply with A and you get the, you get the new solution. So that's a, a, simple, a simple approach. Um, of course, uh, it's easy to see that finding this A, finding this linear space is sort of one of the issues. Um, and uh, there are basically two ways that this has been done historically. One is what is called proper orthogonal in the composition. I'll show in the next slide what these two things mean. And the second one is the media problem. So, um, so the first one, which is by snapshot, which is what leads to what is called proper orthogonal in the composition, in some sense, is a simple one. You sample parameter states, and for every parameter, you solve the problem, and you get a solution. And you stack them all up here, uh, all the little boxes. There you go. Make them into vectors, creates a large snapshot matrix, computes its SVD, and look at what happens to the singular vectors. And this gives you an idea of what is the kind of information you have in all these snapshots. And, and, and then basically you pick those orthogonal vectors that have the most, that have the most information, if you will, as reflected in the singular values. And then that is your linear space. Now, how can you see that this work? What if you, put, if you pick all the samples in an unfortunate way and so on? So you have to think about how to do that. But the in principle, this is the idea of a public open composition. Sample parameter space, you stack them up, you do an SVD, and you pick the space. Now, another way of doing it is what is called the greedy approach. Imagine you have an error estimator that tells you the current linear space, as I move around the parameter space, how good of a job you have to do. Okay, imagine I can come up with an estimator that does that. Then I can simply say, okay, with the current linear space I have, look for the parameter mu where I make the biggest mistake in representing the solution. And that's now my new matrix, my, my new solution, and I add that and I grow it like that. Okay, so this is called a greedy approach. And of course, the advantage is that you compute only those solutions that you really need. Whereas with the SVD, you would have to compute a lot and then maybe only use 10% of them in a certain sense. Okay, so this is the greedy approach. And, and uh, but the, the crux here, and you'll see it in a minute, is that uh, I have created the linear space A based only on accuracy. Okay? There's no consideration about ability. And once you start solving time dependent problems, we all know that ability is the second half of the question. So, so what can happen? Well, first of all, what is that we find to do? But we're basically saying, have a, have a have PD that somehow as you change the parameter of P, the solution moves around on some solution manifold, which we don't know. And we're trying to represent the solution manifold by some linear space. That's, that's the assumption that can be done. And we assume, at least in, in, for now, that this is a global representation. So the entire solution space is represented by this. And we'll quickly see that for certain types of problems, this is not a good idea. Um, so how do you measure whether this is successful or not? This is, uh, there is a measure called the Kolmogorov basically basic maps answers the question with a certain linear space, how well can I do in approximating uh, the solution? And now the question you want to know is, as I grow the space, how rapidly does this error go down? It goes down very slowly, slowly I would need a large space. space. And then the space is maybe not so attractive. Whereas if it increases really fast, then I can have a compact basis. And 
for elliptic problems, you can prove that indeed the Kolmogorov uh, end with typically is exponential fast, which means once you sort of start getting it, then you can track to with a very low basis. And the other extreme is if you're looking at a transport problem, it's like one with the river. Okay, so it's a very okay. And and uh, so my background uh, historically is on transport problems, so I get stuck in this one. Uh, now, just to see what happens if you just take the POD and you apply it to the this is a scalar water equation, so it's a little two system, two system uh, non linear uh, conservation loads, you project it on, you, you run out of the model and you let it evolve, um, and very quickly you see uh, this happens. Okay, in other words, it's unstable. Now, now, you could say, you could well, say, maybe well, this maybe is simply because I'm under resolved. So let me so let put in put some, some modes here. here. K is already, already eight, so I already have 80 basis functions, which is pretty high. But well, let me let me double it. Let's just see what happens if I double. So now it's 60, 60 160. There it goes again. Yeah. And if I go to see if it blows up faster. Now, if you're doing numerical analysis, you know that when this happens, it's unstable. Something, something fundamentally, fundamentally something fundamentally with the model, right? And, and, and it's, it's not so hard to understand why this is, because you have made no effort to no pick a basis, basis that somehow gives you a similar scheme that has, that has some, some sort of fertility property. You, it's not, you collect the basis, base and base, purely based on, on, um, on X. So, so there's sort of two questions I want to talk a little bit about, which is, so the, these projections have reduced all the models, which, which I outlined briefly. If you do elliptic problems, 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 problems uh, they work extremely well. Okay, there's a lot of literature, lot of literature to prove a lot of interesting results. But once you go to time dependent problem, the issue of stability becomes a concern, and the standard way of developing the spaces doesn't talk about stability. And then, and then the second the question is the idea of using a global basis to represent the solution is probably not a good idea because you have this very slow decay of the Kolmogorov end width and therefore you need a very large basis and then uh, it becomes much less attractive. Okay, there's all kinds of things going on on my screen. So that's why I get a little confused, but uh, let's see. Okay. So, so, so to, to give, give some sort of framework, framework of, of, uh, of how to try and understand these problems and how to potentially solve some of them, let me look at Hamiltonian uh, problems. So Hamiltonian problems, Hamiltonian problems for those of you who uh, perhaps are less aware, or less familiar, uh, are, are framed like this. B and Q are called the conjugate variables. Uh, and H is the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian. And, and H is, is typically the energy, but maybe it doesn't need to be the energy. It can be other, other things, but in most cases, it is an energy. And if you write that on sort of system form, you get an equation that looks like this, where J is the skew-symmetric operator. So this problem is called the canonical uh, Hamiltonian problem. Uh, now, the goal here now is to see, to ask ourselves if we can come up with a reduced basis that when we do the projection, just as I did for the original problem, you end up with a semi-discrete scheme which maintains a Hamiltonian structure. So it has the same kind of structure because this will guarantee that you have a lot of, of preservation of the structure of the stability. So, so for this, we need to introduce
Okay. And then the echo comes back. Let's see. Okay. Uh, uh, so A has basically two conjugate variables and uh, they, they have certain properties that have to be mutually orthogonal uh, and so on. And, uh, and they have to satisfy this, uh, this identity. So if you define the operator omega like this, J again is what, it, what, what we have defined previously, these conjugate variables have to satisfy this. This is a, a property of, of the Hamiltonian product. So now we have defined a matrix A that uh, has that property. Now let us see why, why this is interesting. Uh, now, first of all, you can show, this was done uh, about five, six years ago, that if you have a matrix A that has this property, you can define its pseudo inverse, and the pseudo inverse is also symplectic. Okay, so this, this property carries over. Uh, and uh, in particular, A pseudo inverse A is the identity which we need for the projection. Okay. Now, now, now let's now let's let's, uh, let's, uh, go, let's go forward, forward with this idea. idea. Again, so again, we make an, we assumption, make an assumption that we can represent our, our solution set at, at a times y. y. But now, but now a is a a a symplectic, symplectic uh, a symplectic matrix. Can you tell the moderator that when I turn on, when I unmute? Uh, there's a huge echo in the room. He, can, he keeps telling me, unmute, unmute. But maybe they cannot hear me remotely. I don't know what the situation is. Anyway, let's go. Uh, now, if we then just go ahead and do what, what, what we did before, we plug it in. You have now the substitution. We do the Golovkin projection. Now we get a system of equations, which is, uh, the reduced order model, but if A has this property that it's symplectic, then this operator here in front is exactly this canonical J. And then we have recovered a problem which is, which maintains its Hamiltonian structure with a slightly different Hamiltonian because it's like this, but it's still a Hamiltonian problem. This, this one doesn't this one doesn't work right now so let me let me stand here okay so let's uh, fine so now so then now this, this this the last question is well how do I find this matrix a that is a good approximate that has good approximation properties and has the structure that it's symplectic if that's the case then I have I have uh, uh, reach my goal. Now, of course, this could be a, a nonlinear optimization problem. I have a data set Y. I'm looking for a matrix A that satisfies and represents this data space, this, this data set as, as well as I as well as I can hope for, under the constraint that A is symplectic. This is a nonlinear optimization problem. It's a very difficult one. Uh, but in principle, you could solve it like that. Uh, you can also uh, use an SVD in a clever way uh, by realizing that in fact, because you have these conjugate variables, you can write it as a, as a, as a complex problem and you can solve it using a complex SVD. Um, or you can, do a, you can use a greedy approach. I will use a greedy approach. And what will the error estimator be? Well, it'll be the Hamiltonian because I know that the Hamiltonian is, is, should, be, should be conserved. So as I've enriched my basis, I should reach a point where I, I um, can approximate the Hamiltonian better and better of the initial conditions that would be there. Okay, so just very, I'm not gonna spend a lot, but you can see basically the idea is compute for, for the basis that you have, compute the error, the maximum error in the Hamiltonian uh, with the basis that you have. That is now the new parameter value for which you compute a solution. 
here, then you compute a solution of, uh, of, if you will, the half of the new vector, and then construct the other half to satisfy the symplectic constraint. And then you have now enriched the basis by one and you grow it. Okay, you can prove in fact, that the greedy approach, if, if the uh, um, Kolmogorov uh, decays exponentially fast, we will, we, will, we will create a basis like that, that also guarantees an exponentially fast uh, approximation to the problem um, with, with an error estimator. Now, what about nonlinear problems? What I did was, was only about approximation. Now, for a nonlinear problem, it's a little more complicated because you have now the linear problem here, or the, the, the general problem here, G is now a nonlinear operator. When you do the projection, well, if it's nonlinear, you cannot move the projection to the operator. So in order to do it, you would have to take G of A of Y and then project it back to the reduced space. But then you have lost the, the goal, which is to create a method which is practically independent of the number of degrees of freedom in the original problem. So the way to, to get around that is what is called the empirical interpolation. So it's a nonlinear problem dependent interpolation where the interpolation is reflected in this matrix P, which is basically a matrix that has zeros almost everywhere, except at a few points where you do sample the solution and basically interpolate the entire solution using those points. Okay. Uh, now, the question is, does this maintain the symplectic behavior? So we know we can do it for the linear problem. Can you do it for the nonlinear problem? And the answer is, uh, is almost, but not exactly. Okay, so you can construct solutions, problems, where in fact, the answer is no, but, uh, but it is a very, very good approximation. You can quantify what very, very good means, but it's not exact, okay, to be honest. Uh, and this is one of the open problems, is how to accelerate nonlinear terms while maintaining exactly the structure. Uh, so let's go back to the, to the shallow water equation, just as an example, we saw it blow up. Now, what I'm gonna show you, the only difference is how the base is constructed. There's, there's no other difference, okay? And so here are two solutions uh, that will run in a minute. There you go. One is now the reduced order model, uh, and the other one is the full solution. Okay, and, and I mean, at least visually, there's, there's no difference, but the point is that the only difference is how the basis has been chosen. So, so the, the message here is that in reduced order modeling, as well as in, in, in classic final element, classic approximation theory for PDEs, where we know that we have to pick the spaces carefully, you have to do the same thing for the time dependent uh, reduced order model. But if you do it, at least for the Hamiltonian problem, uh, you recover the accuracy, the, 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 um, not the accuracy, the, the properties that you're looking for. Okay, so here the top one is the full model. And so you can see there's, there's, a, there's less than a tenth of the number of degrees of freedom in solving the problem. And if you look at the accuracy, I mean, you, as you would, so the arrow is constant. If you do the POD, which is what we saw in the first picture, the arrow blows up. The code blows. Now, the problem that I looked at first is the canonical problem. In other words, J here, which is called the Poisson operator, is the skew identity matrix. Now, for many problems that are interesting, all equations, other kinds of problems that you can that you can represent in Hamiltonian form, uh, this Poisson operator is much more complicated, and it's and it and it's nonlinear. So the question is, what happens now? Well, this, this J here can be degenerate. It can have, uh, it doesn't need to have full rank because there can be additional invariance that is more than just simply the Hamiltonian. Uh, and again, the Poisson operator is, is, uh, is state dependent. So, so how to think about that? Well, let's start by saying J is constant but general, okay? That's sort of the first step. Then the way to deal with that is, is you need two results, uh, which has been around for a while. So Dabo's theorem tells you 
that locally as it evolves, this, this, uh, this now in this case, it won't evolve, but it will be full. Locally, there is a map that brings it back to canonical form. Um, and, uh, and the other theorem, which is the Lee Weinstein theorem tells you that it is possible to split the dynamics into that of the active variables and the um, invariants. Okay, so a simple way of looking at it is to say, well, so this means that in some way I should be able to find a map that takes my general matrix, my general Poisson operator, and makes it into something which is the schoosymmetric part, the canonical part, and then some invariance. And in physics, this is this is well known. The, 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 these new variables are called the Klebs variables, and uh, and the invariants are called the Cassini's. And there's a big literature on on that. Um, now you need a result to do this in a general in a general uh, way, which is if I give you a schoosymmetric matrix, can you actually always find this decomposition? Can you always take the schoosymmetric matrix and make it into something? which is a canonical part and a, and a singular part. And so the answer is yes, there is, you can guarantee that there's always such a transformation uh, decomposition with a matrix U. U is invertible, but it's, uh, but it's not orthogonal, uh, but, but it does exist. Now, so if you have that, then, then in, in many ways you're, you're, you're now, you're, you're done, right? You take the general operator J, you decompose it, and this immediately generates two systems. One is the, the um, Hamiltonian problem in the Casimirs, and then the Klebs variables. And the Klebs variables, you don't need to evolve on it's the other way around. <laughs> Hamiltonian system in the Klebs variables and the Casimirs are the, are the invariants, I'm sorry. Um, and those, of course, you don't need to in principle evolve. Uh, you can prove a number of results about stability of the system and so on. And again, you can do the nonlinear part with the empirical interpolation um, and, and, and go through it like that. Okay, so let me give you an example. Here's so the KDB equation. Uh, for those who don't know the KDB equation, so it's a nonlinear dispersive uh, third order equation that uh, was proposed by Kodak de Vries for, to describe uh, waves and channels actually in, in channels in, in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and so it's a nonlinear dispersive, but it has a Hamiltonian formulation. Uh, and uh, so you can go through this. Some of the Casimirs are, they're simply a mass. And then there's something that looks like a total variation, but it's not a total variation because it's not an absolute value. Now, if you then go ahead and you solve the problem uh, using the machinery that I just described. The graphics doesn't come through very well. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so this is, so the, the KDB equation is interesting. Or it's one of the soliton equations. So it has solitons and solutions that can move through each other without changing shape. Um, and, um, and maybe we can just look at the one here at the bottom. Uh, the, 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 the red and the blue down here are basically the Casimirs. So as one would expect, they're basically accurate to the, to the machine accuracy. The Hamiltonian uh, is not exactly preserved because if that's what you want, you also have to pick a time-stepping scheme that maintains that. Now on the left here, the time-stepping scheme does not do that. On the right, it does. And you can see that the Hamiltonian is, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't change over time. So now you have obtained a scheme where you maintain the structure, the invariants, in fact, remain invariants, uh, and you ensure stability if you pick space and time uh, carefully. So this one is an interesting problem if you want to get challenged. Um, so what happens is that when this epsilon, the dispersive term goes to zero, the solution generates, or the equation generates very unpleasant solutions, which are these very high frequency waves that sets up after the, this is called the small, the small dispersion limit problem. And, uh, and you can see the solution here on the right. In fact, there are two solutions. There's the full solution and the reduced order model solution. And you can see they, they completely overlap. 
the Hamiltonian, the, in this case, the, the, the arrow is in here. So you can see that the arrow is, is it's not exploding, it's not unstable. Um, the invariants are fully under control. But of course, you see the problem here, which is the one that I talked about early on, which is, okay, so I need 1600 degrees of freedom in order to solve the problem with, with my, with my uh, finite difference solver in this case, um, because of this very highly oscillatory solution. And, and there is a reduced order model that I can use, but I need 240 snapshots or 240 uh, dimensions. And then it's a factor of eight. It's not, it's not interesting. To, to do it, then it's, it's better just to do the, the, uh, the full one. So we'll get back to this in a minute. And just uh, sort of the last iteration, if you will, is, well, what if it's really a state dependent Poisson operator? How would you deal with that? And, and the way that we deal with it is by actually evolving. So it's sort of, you go back from the manifold out to the linear manifold, you, you evolve, you evolve the, the map locally, you do this transformation, into the canonical form and the invariance, you evolve that, you go back and forth between the two. Okay, so there's an approximation between um, between the mapping, evolving, and back. Now there's an there's a there's a, an accuracy that is involved in this, which impacts um, the overall accuracy, uh, which you can you can control it, um, and and it can be understood. You can you can prove uh, a priori estimates with. And just to give you an example, so here's a simple, uh, so this is the interacting species. Uh, if you write it as a, as a Hamiltonian problem, it's here at the bottom and you can see it, it is a Hamiltonian problem. It is, uh, but if you want to write it with a J, the J now depends on, on P and Q. So it's a, it's a more general problem. Um, and, and again, you go through everything that I just briefly described. This is the accuracy of the solution. You can see it doesn't blow up 10 to the minus nine, all the invariants uh, are preserved uh, in the reduced order model and you maintain, you maintain that. So, so the last thing I wanted to touch on was, uh, well, all the solutions I've shown you because they are strongly transport dominated end up having a very large basis. And this makes it much less uh, attractive. And, and the, only no, the only way to deal with that is to introduce the notion of a nonlinear basis. In other words, you have to somehow move away from the idea of having a global basis that represents all the dynamics and parameter space to something that is nonlinear uh, in some way. Uh, now, the challenge here is in, in, in this, and, and people have been working on this for many years, well, well, at least for 10 years. Um, but, but now the challenge here is, I want to all of, do all of this while maintaining this, this structure constraint uh, on the problem, okay? So the way that we'll do it is with an evolving basis. We will let the basis evolve as, uh, with the solution. So, so think about a slightly different problem now where R now is a matrix where it is not only the matrix of the solution, but it's the matrix of the solution for all the parameters that I'm interested in solving for. It's a, so it can be a very large matrix. So this is the matrix R. So if one wants to look at the problem sort of uh, in general, it would look like this. Uh, and now I want to solve for all these parameters at the same, at the same time. So we'll look for a solution where we assume that you can represent the solution with, with two components uh, use the reduced basis, but now the basis will be time dependent. That would be the assumption. And set are the coefficients, but they will be time dependent just as they have been so far. Right? So we have to write equations for both set and Q now, and, and, and U now. Right? Now there are some constraints that we have to pose on this because we want U to have some properties. It should be orthogonal and it should be symplectic because otherwise we lose all this machinery. And, and then there's a rank condition on set, and you'll see it in a minute why this becomes important. But the easiest way to think of it is, well, if, if I have, if I sort of over-resolve my problem, then the coefficient set will decay very quickly, and you will have a matrix which is basically singular or very close to singular because you're over-resolved. You, you have a lot of degrees of freedom that maybe you don't need. Um, 
Now, so what is it that needs to be done? Well, you have sort of a you have a solution uh, here R, and then it's represented by some linear space. It's a local linear space, but nevertheless. And then we have to make sure that the linear space U evolves or sort of staying on the manifold so that it doesn't start doing all kinds of, of strange things. So you have to evolve it and then project it onto the manifold tangent space. Now, if you go through the machinery of trying to derive what that looks like, you get an equation for the set, which is the Hamiltonian equation. That's what you would expect. It's the Hamiltonian problem we're trying to solve. And then you get an equation for U, which is uh, a much more complicated equation, but basically it does be complicated because it doesn't only evolve, but it has to evolve in a very constrained way. So, so trust me, it looks like this. But here, you get now this term, which is precisely the term that I said before, had to have a certain rank. Because if not, well, then we cannot, then this is not invertible, and therefore we cannot find the, 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 the space U, and then uh, who knows what happens. Okay, so there are sort of two situations. If this is really very poorly conditioned, you can regularize it in some way. Um, or you can take the second step, which is you can uh, reduce its size. Now, what about time stepping? Well, time stepping is a is a is a bit tricky. Except, okay. So for the for the for the set for the for the for the Hamiltonian uh, problems, those we will so we will use an implicit uh, structure preserving time stepping scheme. Uh, there are several of them around. But for the matrix for for you, one has to be careful because again, you need to evolve it sort of in a very particular way. So the way that we do is we project it onto the tangent space, which is a linear space. And there you can pick any method because basically almost any time-stepping method will preserve linear invariance. Uh, so you can pick any kind of uh, um, that you that you want. And then basically, so you have to define an operator R and compute it, which projects you onto this tangent space. That's where you evolve and then you project it back. Okay. Now, the last thing is, uh, can, you, can you not only evolve the basis, but also change it with the problem? Okay, now, how do you decrease it? Well, that's pretty simple, because if, uh, if the rank condition of set indicates that you're over resolved, you can just reduce the size of the problem. So that's not so hard. The hard part is, if the error indicator tells you that you are under resolved, then, then what do you do? And the, the, the key problem is how do you enrich the base? How do you find the vector to add on the fly? Right. So the way that we do it is by looking at the residual. So you can define here um, an identity from the Wankuda method. It looks like this. And then look at the uh, error, the error <coughs> in the residual. Uh, so you get now an error matrix. And then we simply have a criteria for what happens with this error matrix, if the error or the norm of it, and if the norm exceeds a certain, a certain number as you go from one to the other, then we claim that this is the error, error indicator, so not an estimator, an indicator tells you you need to do something. And what do you do? You take the leading uh, vector, the leading eigenvector of the matrix E, which is the leading error component, and you add that to your basis. That is your new basis vector. And then you go forward. Okay, so nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, just to show you what happens. So, again, for those who don't know it, this is a model that is, describes quite a number of things uh, propagation optical fibers, for instance. And, and the key question, the key one is sort of this one. So, the parameter here is the initial conditions. So, you run it for a large number, you want to run it for a large number of initial conditions. Now, if you look for a global basis, the singular values is the black line. You see it decays really slowly, which is what you would expect because it's a transport problem. Whereas if you just take a short period of time and you look for the dimension of the basis, it actually drops extremely fast. So, so there is a reduced basis, but not for the global problem, but only for the local problem. 
So if you run the machinery that I now uh, described to you and you set a tolerance of what you want, you can see that the size of the bases that you want, of course, grows with or not, but grows with time and, and goes up to, to here 10. If you want a very high accuracy, maybe it grows up to 50. Uh, but, but compare that to say 10 to this 10 to minus seven. If you want a 10 to minus seven, you should probably have 1400 vectors if you were doing it globally. Okay. So there's a huge potential for saving here if you have all the bases. Uh, but it's a, it's a complicated one because of, of, of the constraints. If you look at the major, the, the vectors you that you are computing, they maintain orthogonality, they maintain the symplectic nature to the, to the um, accuracy of the problem. Okay. And the last one is that is the one of efficiency. Okay. So if you were to run the, the, the full problem for, uh, I think for hundred parameters, uh, the cost is the, is the dashed line. Okay. If you instead were to say, I'm not going to, I'm going to have a dynamic basis, but I'm not going to adapt it. I'm not going to change it. Uh, I'm not going to, to grow it. Then these are the black ones here. And you can see, you can certainly gain a lot, but the accuracy is not great. 10 to minus two, 10 to minus three. Whereas if you start out with say four vectors and you let them evolve, then you can continue to drive down the arrow at relatively little cost. While, while accelerating it by two orders of magnitude. Okay, so this local evolution of the basis is key if you want to do uh, a transport problem. Okay, uh, shallow water equation we have already seen. You see exactly the same, uh, exactly the same problem, exactly the same situation. Okay, so here 2D carries over to 2D. And again, here you have more than two orders of magnitude acceleration. If you go to 3D, it will, it will be even, even more so. But you get it only because you have all the bases. And you have to do it in this way because otherwise the scheme is unstable. So just to sort of summarize the cost, and then I have uh, then I'm, I'm at the end. So so the whole motivation for reduced order models is that if you want to solve a problem many, many times, you can use your standard solver. And the cost of that is each of these blocks up here. So if you want to solve it two times or three times, then fine, then you stick to that. If you want to solve it a thousand times, then clearly you need to think about how to do that. In a reduced order model, you do some work up front to generate the basis, and then you can run it fast uh, because you have a compact basis, if that's the case. Now, if it's a transport problem, you can still generate your basis using a symplectic structure, whatever it is, but the basis is very large, typically. So you will gain something, but you will gain less. And the idea now is to do that with the dynamically reduced model. You have to work a bit harder to begin with to get the right basis that evolves, adapts, all these sorts of things. But then the cost of evaluating the solution is very, very low. And then you have a treat to go. This is the idea of a reduced order model. Okay, so to summarize, reduced order models for time dependent problems is a, is a more complicated problem. The Hamiltonian formulation gives you something to work with. Um, and and uh, you can then go through many of these things uh, and develop what I what I just proposed. There are many open questions uh, for general nonlinearity, more general problems. Um, this is certainly uh, open, uh, and there's a lot of open questions on on actually understanding the error both a priori and a posteriori. So with that, thank you very much for your time. I think I'm pretty much on time. And, uh, and uh, there's a number of, of uh, recent papers on, on these topics. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. The time is up. So uh, let's, uh, let's thank Professor Hesthaven again. And this concludes the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.